Ask any football fan to name the worst ever stadium disaster and you'll probably find that most would say Hillsborough or the Bradford City Fire. Some might say Heysel Stadium Riot and those with long memories might even say that the Ibrox Park tragedy was the worst. As tragic as these disasters undoubtedly were, they pale beside the death toll of the worst football stadium disaster of all time. It happened during an Olympic qualifier match between Argentina and Peru at the Estadio Nacional in Lima. Passions were running high when the host nation Peru played Argentina on the 24th of May 1964 in the Estadio Nacional in the Peruvian capital, Lima. Peru was second in the table at the halfway stage of South America's Olympic qualifying tournament. With Brazil waiting for them in their last game, Peru realistically needed to at least draw against Argentina. The match was a sellout, with 53,000 spectators packed into the stands. Argentina were leading 1-0 with only minutes of play remaining when Peruvian winger Lobaton scored the equaliser. The home crowd erupted, roaring with delight at the late goal. However, delight turned to disbelief when the Uruguayan referee Angel Bazos disallowed the goal. The crowd was in uproar over the decision, and one spectator, a local character known as La Bomba, decided to take matters into his own hands, running onto the pitch to argue personally with the referee. The police response was brutal, attacking La Bomba en masse, beating him with batons and setting loose the police dogs. This spectacle of police brutality further enraged the volatile crowd. As one spectator recounted, our very own policemen were kicking him and beating him as if he were the enemy. This is what raised everybody's anger, including mine. The crowd in the south stand surged forwards, spilling over the iron fence and onto the pitch. The two teams and the referee, sensing the mood of the crowd, hastily exited the pitch as spectators and police began to clash. Inside the stadium, the situation began to deteriorate rapidly. Windows were broken and fires were lit in the stands. The police responded by firing tear gas into the crowd and shooting rifles into the air. Walls were broken down and rioting fans hurled the bricks at the police. Panicked spectators began to crush into the exit tunnels as the rioting on the pitch and in the stands intensified. Access to the terraces was through a series of stairway tunnels which led down to street level, but during a match the exits to these tunnels were closed off with corrugated metal shutters. As the solid mass of people continued to cram into the tunnels, those further down inside were crushed and trampled as there was simply no way out. The force of people packed inside now prevented the shutters from being raised from the outside. Eventually, the sheer pressure of bodies pushing on the shutters caused them to burst outwards, and some fortunate trapped souls were pulled free. All those who died, died in the crush in the tunnels. The cause of death was either through being trampled on, or from compressive asphyxia. People were trapped in the stairwells for hours, crushed in with the dead and the injured, unable to move, barely able to breathe. It's hard to imagine just how traumatic it must have been for the lucky ones who managed to survive. The official death toll is given as 328, with over 500 more wounded. This death toll stands as the highest ever for a football match disaster. Ironically, all those who caused the initial panic by rioting in the stadium survived. The dead and injured were taken to the nearest hospital, 
but being quickly overwhelmed with a number of casualties, a temporary morgue was set up outside on the lawn. Here, the friends and relatives of missing people were to endure the agonising task of searching through the rows of victims, looking for their loved ones. Tragedies and disasters like this will often bring out the best in human nature. The desire to help one's fellow man, putting aside one's own troubles to help others. The shared trauma of tragedy can bring people together in ways that other events do not. However, sometimes disasters can also bring out the worst in people, and this tragedy was to prove no exception. Members of the rioting mob that had escaped the confines of the stadium began to riot outside, setting fire to buses and cars and continuing to fight with police. Reports state that two policemen were killed, lynched by the angry mob. Shops were looted and set ablaze, and police responded by firing live rounds at the crowd. Many cars were stolen from the stadium car park in the confusion, and looters stripped the injured and the dead of valuables in full view of onlookers. The mob began to march down to the presidential palace, shouting demands for President Fernando Thierry to intervene and declare the match a draw. Incredibly, even amongst the scenes of chaos and carnage, the disputed goal was not to be forgotten. Calm finally descended by the next day, and a period of seven days of national mourning was announced. A temporary state of emergency was declared across Peru, but even as the scale of the tragedy was being revealed, the blame was already being passed around as politicians began looking for scapegoats. The government blamed far-left agitators for starting the riot, whilst others were keen to point out the police brutality which many blamed for souring the mood at the match. Accusations and conspiracy theories emanated from both sides. The whole thing was either an orchestrated plot to attack on the part of the crowd, or a planned incitement of a riot on the part of the police and the government, so that they could implement their own brutal crackdown. An official inquiry was launched, headed up by Judge Benjamin Castaneda. His report was eventually thrown out by the government for being six months late, and the judge himself was fined for not attending all 328 autopsies, as was his prescribed duty. The police commander who ordered the firing of the tear gas into the stands, George Azumbuja, was jailed for 30 months. The decision was made to reduce the stadium capacity, down from 53,000 to 40,000. But apart from that, many seemed quick to put the whole thing behind them. However, there were eyewitness reports of people being shot by the police, and of the bodies being removed from the morgues before relatives were able to claim them. Families spoke of relatives having gone to the match, but who never returned and were not listed amongst the dead. To this day, Rumours persist that the death toll was higher than the official number given due to the armed response of the police. We will probably never know the actual death toll from that fateful day, but even so, at 328 confirmed victims, it remains the worst ever number of fatalities for a football tragedy. Today, the stadium still stands and is in constant use. It was refurbished in 2010 to bring it up to 21st century safety standards, but there is no plaque or memorial to the victims of the 1964 disaster. It seems that, in the case of the Lima football riot, people would rather forget than remember.